What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Real Estate Uncensored. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a wonderful, wonderful repeat guest with us. Jay Salmon is back. This is his third appearance on the show. We are super pumped to have him here. We're going to talk about his latest book. We had an amazing time the last couple of times talking about Disrupt You, which was fantastic. Uh, if you haven't picked that up, you should go grab that. But more importantly, you should grab the new book, Future Proofing You. We're going to get into the content of that book. We're going to talk about insight and perseverance. We're going to talk about uh, how Jay basically took someone from welfare to a self-made millionaire in less than a year, which, I mean, this is a, just a crazy, crazy story. I know Jay's told it a bunch of times by now, but we're going to extract it again, uh, and we're going to dig into some of the the nuggets that he has to share. we got a bunch of stuff to get into. Gene is here, the evil bald ninja. He's over on the side. We've got Greg. He's having some internet issues, so he'll uh, we'll try to get him in, worked in as much as possible. So, Jay, first of all, how have you been? It's been a couple years since we had you on the show. You've done a bunch of stuff. We, we caught you before you ended up as the uh, VP at large of Deloitte, a some 40 some billion dollar international company. I think you did that for a bit, but you've had an interesting last couple of years. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, the Deloitte was interesting. I was brought in as vice chairman. Uh, as I said, half of all jobs will be disappearing over the next five years. So that we think of truck drivers and self driving vehicles, but we don't think of that most accounting will be AI systems, most audit, yeah. most uh, lawyers, most middle management. So if you think it's just affecting the blue collar people, you're going to be seriously challenged. The other big change was I spent five years explaining to people that whether by choice or circumstance, every career gets disrupted. I don't have to make that argument anymore. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Okay. Our, our friend coronavirus uh, kind of proved it. And uh, it's funny. You can look back on the net. I did a speech where somebody said, what's the biggest disruption we'll see? And this is six years ago. I said, the pandemic. And I explained why. And Everybody shrugs, but the world continues to change and disrupt you is probably the most gratifying thing I've done in my life. Because when I was a CEO of a public company or when you have hundreds of thousands of employees, your inbox is, I hate you, we're suing you, problem, problem, problem. When you write something that empowers people to actually make concrete changes to their lives, your inbox gets filled with what I call love letters. I mean, you just hear from these people. And uh, so it's been a great ride. Yeah. And I assume you're looking back, you know, to get back out on the road, speak again. I think live events are, you know, seem to be slowly coming back. I don't know what your speaking schedule is like, but are you seeing events start to reach out to you and book you for later this year? So the speaking hasn't slowed down. I just don't have to be on an airplane to do it. So I've been doing virtual events throughout the entire thing. Uh, like the January of 2020, right before the lockdown, I was in uh, 12 countries and four continents. So the idea that I suddenly got a gift of time, you know, I took this very seriously. I stayed locked in for 330 days. Uh, you know, I just tried to put the time to best use because that's that's all that we have is time. And so that's when I, I wrote this book and got it out as quickly as possible. Uh, the genesis of, of Future Proofing You was I got an email from somebody that, that really liked Disrupt You but said that they could never do it. And I couldn't understand where I dropped the ball because in communication, if somebody can't follow through, it's on you. So I decided to do an audacious experiment. There's thousands of self-help books out there. Most of them are BS. Uh, but what if I put my reputation on the line? What if I took an immigrant who grew up on welfare, who was homeless and couch surfing and mentored him one day a week? I gave him no cash. I gave him no introductions and he had to start a business that took zero capital. Spoiler alert, if you're going to read Future Proofing You, he hit his million dollars in 11 months. And I took those sessions down to 12 truths. If you follow these 12 truths, you will have the same results. This isn't a get rich quick scheme. This isn't some gimmick. Vin Clancy, the young man's name, he was willing to work harder than most people will for a year in order to live in a manner most people can't for the rest of his life. Yeah. So I think it's a fair exchange. Yeah. Can I can I jump in there real quick? What, sure. What, why I'm curious, like, and I I may be off, like I have no background here, so this is exciting to me, and I'm excited to see the twelve principles. Of this this group you're starting, I'm super interested in it. Um, why why did he put his trust in you? Ah, so interesting. And this is I I have this in the book. When we first met, after our first meeting, he sat down and wrote a note to himself, and he gave it to me six months later when there was trust. And, and that first meeting, he basically wrote, 
I have nothing going on. I don't believe this is possible. I don't believe this old dude. But since I got nothing else going on, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. And the challenge, the first truth of the 12 truths is you have to have a growth mindset. And you guys talk about this all the time and, and you understand this. But my challenge was how do you get somebody with that background where there's scarcity and scarcity of mindset? How do you get them to flip that switch as quickly as possible? Because my goal was to make him a million, make him become a millionaire in a year. And so he didn't find this out till he read the book. In our first meeting, I lied to him. <laughs> there okay. is a psychological principle called the Pygmalion effect. A uh, professor went to a school, tested all the kids, told the teachers three of the students were super learners, super achievers. They'd excel that year. At the end of the year, those three kids killed it compared to the rest of the school. But the professor lied. He picked three names out of a hat. But if you tell people they're special and you treat them special, they act special. So I told Vin in our first meeting that I interviewed over 100 candidates. And he was the only one that had all the attributes to be a self-made millionaire. And by the time the first month he had made $60,000, he could have walked on water. I mean, he had completely embraced it. And in any journey, you don't know what's going to happen. Midway through the year, his business got, got like sucker punched. Nothing that he did wrong, nothing that he could have planned for. It got knocked over to shreds. And his goal for that month, it was about month six, was to make 100 grand. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, a book about a guy who made a half a million, that's still a pretty good book, but I don't know. He comes into the meeting, he's dejected because he only made $96,000 that month. Oh and I'm, la I'm laughing inside saying, could the old Vin imagine being upset that he only made $96,000? Yeah. And what he did when his business failed, and this was the proof that he embraced that mindset, was, okay, this doesn't work. What can I do that will work? Because mm -hmm. you fail forward. When, when you fail you don't end up where you start. You either learn or you earn, but either way you're propelled. And so he had embraced that. And, and it was just astounding for me to see that. Yeah. That's yeah. I, I want to get into the failure stuff and like a little bit later on, cause that, that kind of, I, I've worked on that a lot. Let's put it that way. So I want to dig into just the mechanics of, of the business that he started a little bit about the sure. trends that were going on. Cause I think that's really important. One of the things that, that we, often discount or don't take into effect. If you haven't read books like Disrupt You, where you're kind of paying attention to the trends and you're kind of getting your internal deal flow going, you sometimes miss out on these things where there's there's cultural and business trends going on that you can jump on that can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So it's not all on it's not all on you and you coming up with uh, something brilliant from the ground up. You got to tap into like external growth. And I think he did a really good job of that. So how did he choose to get into the the spaces that he chose? So he, when I asked him, what business do you want to do? Being a millennial, he grew up with social media and thought of himself as somebody that understood it and you know, wanted to have a rep as a, as a hacker. He's not a programmer, but the idea that he could do shortcuts and, and, and do social media for people. Well, when you're broke nobody, you're not going to suddenly get a call from the chairman of Pepsi. Hey, will you do our social media? We'll pay you a bundle. It doesn't work that way. And there's probably 40 million other people that are doing social media that... Uh, how are you going to differentiate? So one of the 12 truths is to fill a void. I, I hate competition. This probably shocks people. But I am convinced on any day there is somebody better connected, better funded, smarter, better looking. I hate that person. But if you can avoid that competition as long as possible, then you can succeed. So if you're the make yourself unique and do something no one else is doing, by definition, you're the best in the world at that. So I said, Vin, everybody's doing social media. Find something happening in the news, something in the zeitgeist of society that is new and make yourself the social media expert for that one thing. And so at that time, this was the year that Bitcoin went from $1,000 to $20,000. Everybody's talking about it. All these new currencies were coming out. They were doing initial coin offerings. So he made himself the expert to do social media for cryptocurrency. You get your first client, whether you get them for free or however you get them. But then when you kill it for that client, you now have what they call at Harvard Business School, a case study. <laughs> so then you can go to client number two and go, look what I did to for this guy. So the same people that you know, were paying them you know, $500 that first month, new clients were paying them 30,000 a month for the same amount of work. 
And it really is that simple. And then it gets into deal structure. So many people that have a side hustle, they get paid to do something. When it ends, they're out of work. Why not say to that person, okay, you're hiring me to do marketing. You want to sell $100,000 uh, worth of widgets. If I, if I do such a good job, you sell $200,000, can I get this bonus? If I sell a million dollars worth, can I get 200,000? At that moment, people will say, absolutely. But when you make it happen, now you've got a new revenue stream. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he gets into, he's paying attention. Did he know anything about cryptocurrency when he got into it? Like, was there a passing interest at least before he jumped into the business? No. Really? That's really impressive. Yeah. Okay. So he starts on the ground up with kind of a you know, little, maybe a growth hackers mentality to social media. He goes into an industry he knows nothing about. Uh, do you remember, like, was there anything special about how he got that first client or did he, did he just basically cold prospect his way into a uh, connection? So I, I don't know specifically, but one of the pieces of advice that I give to people in any situation is you can always do your first piece of marketing for charity, pick any charity, any mm -hmm. cause. Right. Because charities aren't run by robots. They're run by senior people that work at other corporations that this is how they, they pay it forward and get involved. And so you'll get noticed. Um, I, yeah. I had a, a social media ad agency a few years ago that I was a CEO of. It was a failed startup. They burned through $8 million, had 30000 in revenue. The VCs were going to close them down. I came in and I did the same technique. So I took... Uh, I took the famous video that was on uh, one of the top five videos on YouTube of sneezing panda. Do you remember that the little baby panda sneezes and the big yeah. mommy jumps? Yeah. And I, I just hijacked that. And basically, when you search for that, we'd come up first in the search results. It'd be that same video. Watching a panda sneeze is fun. Saving them from extinction is even better. And then I clicked through to World Wildlife Fund. That got massive traffic. And next thing you know, we get noticed by Coke and Disney and Microsoft. And 18 months later, sold the failed uh, company was sold to News Corp for $200 million. So same principle. <laughs> That's insane. That's such an insane story. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So... We, the, so there's that first of all, that's a great strategy because that's super, super ninja. I don't think people realize that 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 nonprofits, the people that sit on the boards of nonprofits are the people that are high level executives in other spaces. So it's a great way to get, get your foot in the door. I Not love just that. the boards, the volunteers, the people that are, are working. Really? I mean, yeah, these are people yeah, that have crazy. spare time, people that are struggling and, and are working to death. Three jobs are not, you know, sitting on committees planning what color T-shirt should be for the 10K run. <laughs> a great oh. point. That is a good point. It is it's actually a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he uh, so he starts this business. He gets into crypto, right? He's so he's running a social media kind of growth hacking strategy for uh, for ICOs. And right. what do you remember? What the uh, I, I don't know if you want to go into this or not, but I'm curious. What was the hit that his business took that almost that like dejected him so bad? Uh, so he's doing good, honest business, building a reputation, speaking at conferences, doing everything that you should be doing, and he he's had that stake in the ground. He was the guy and he only had so many hours in the day. So you can raise your rate, supply and demand. Then one day, Google and Facebook announced that they would not allow any advertising on anything having to do with crypto. Okay. Period. Holy Full stop. God. First time in their history that they'd ever blocked an industry. Mm -hmm. How could you see that coming? Right. Um, that was a lot of government pressure on them because governments didn't understand it. And there's the whole, you know, crypto's evil and, you know, all, all the stuff that, you know, every new industry does. But what he had set up along the way and when we had discussions was, OK, you now we're having these big ticket clients. You can't do the little stuff, but you know enough guys that can. So why not hand off these things and take a percentage? Mm -hmm. So you have these other revenue streams. And the tools and, and techniques that you're using, why not amass those into a course that people can download and get and, and, and sell that and start a typical uh, sales funnel? So he had those all teed up. And what he realized that shocked me was the techniques that he was using to sell his course he could use for the ICOs and no longer need to rely on Google or Facebook, and he could still reach the same number of people. And that was mm. a phenomenal insight of his. Remember, my, my key premise is you only need two things for success. 
-hmm. insight and perseverance. As you remember, because I know you guys did it, the three problems a day for 30 days, I can teach you how to get insights. Mm -hmm. In this book, I really take it to the next level of how do you cultivate your perseverance and turn it into passion. Passion will get you farther than anything else in life. And the biggest hole that was missing in Future Proofing You is I didn't address the mythology of the self-made man or woman. It doesn't exist. You will need a series of mentors. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the truths is, is to not fly solo. And I teach you how to find those mentors. And if you believe in a world of abundance, you can now understand why people want to help you succeed and how you'll find different ones for different stages of your journey. Hmm. Well, it's funny because you mentioned I, I was I my natural reaction was I was going to go deeper on insight, but that's you can tell you're like you're you're way more passionate about going into the perseverance side of it. So when you say you went like cultivating perseverance and turning it into a passion, like right. what what do you mean by that? What does it mean to cultivate perseverance? So to 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 really you're going to have to work on how are you solving that problem? Who are you solving for? What do you, what do you want to do? I, I'm a big believer that the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. Um, in Future Proofing You, know, I tell the story of one of my dearest friends who was lucky enough in like fourth grade to have a playground swing knock out her front teeth. I say lucky enough because as miserable as that made her, when the dental surgeon gave her back her smile, it was like the clouds lit up. That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to give people back their uh -huh. smile. And she's been a dental surgeon her whole career and loves it. Most of us don't have those moments, okay? Yeah. When, I, when I talk to children, I, I hate when parents go, what do you want to be when you grow up? Wrong question. What problem do you want to solve? Because kids feel injustice. Kids see incompleteness. And, and we experience this all the time. Anybody can make a pair of shoes, la-di-da. But when Tom Shoes says for every pair you buy, somebody that's never owned a pair gets their first pair of shoes on their feet, how does that make you feel? How does it make the customer feel? That's what I mean by passion. Mm. That's really good. Um, okay. So going back to the insight, you mentioned the three deals in 30 days. Let's summarize that real quick just for people that may have missed that and disrupt you. So the way so, that you think about it, yeah, let's go ahead. I'll let you explain. And then I want to piggyback off that with a couple of questions. Sure. So the way to, to make money is not sell things. Entrepreneurs okay. solve things, solve a problem for a few people. You have friends, solve for a million, become wealthy, solve for a billion, you change history. So if you have problems, congratulations. So here's what you do. Write down three problems in your life today and do that every day for 30 days. The first day, the second day, fairly easy. After two days, most people go, I have no problems because they're not watching the moment by moment. They're walking around on autopilot and they're not seeing the inconveniences. And before you ask the question, I'll tell you that my favorite one of these that's in, in, in Future Proofing You, every parent can relate to this. A mom, it's Wednesday night, it's 10 o'clock. Her daughter is making a poster board for school for the next day and she messes it up. And the daughter's crying, mommy, mommy, please go back to the store, get me another sheet. So the mom does this, but she doesn't want to do it again. So before she gives the poster board to her daughter, takes a ruler, makes little fine lines on it. The next day she goes, why don't they sell it like that? Okay, it's all for kids' projects. Make a long story short, she gets a patent, goes to the biggest manufacturer, she makes about $5 million off of that patent. <laughs> it's that easy, folks. You don't have to invent the flux capacitor. That's the whole point I try to make with people. Okay. Just solve a problem. We're, we're one click away from 7 billion people. You don't have to solve it for all 7 billion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's tie that let's tie those two concepts together. So three ideas a day for th for thirty days, you, you'll get to the point where you start running out of of essentially problems to solve. But but ha so tell me how that ties into the building of insight because insight is, I guess the the ability to see something in a different way than you've seen it before, and maybe that everybody's seen it before. So how does how does building that deal flow generate insight? So, so now you have 90 ideas in front of you, and you're going to sort them along two axes. Okay. One is total addressable market. How many people does this, you know, affect? You know, mm -hmm. oh, wow, uh, I'm, I'm a left-handed juggler, and they only sell right-handed balls. Not, not a big audience, okay? <laughs> when I teach this at the university level, and I've had students do $100 million the first year. So I have always get students to go deliver food to the dorms. And I'm like, you know, it takes the same amount of effort to build that business as Uber Eats. 
ponder that for a second, which one you want to do. So which affects the most? And then more important than the size of the market and the opportunity, because I've turned down huge money making deals because I have no interest in that business, is how passionate are you about it? How much do you care about the problem that you're solving? I would like to be happily retired and not doing anything, but I'm chairman of a company because they came to me with the problem so big and so important. I felt morally obligated to step forward and say, okay, I will get you through the next level and make sure that this company succeeds. Um, so passion. Okay. If, so, you, if, you pa if you pass a construction site and there's three guys laying bricks and you ask them what they're doing, the first guy says, I'm, I'm, I'm laying bricks. The second guy says, I'm building a building. And the third guy says, I'm making a house of God. Okay. They're building a church. The third guy has a passion for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why immigrants uh, founded one third of the Fortune 500 companies because their their identity isn't I'm working at a fast food place I'm doing manual labor they're on a journey to achieve something and that passion gets them all the way through even if it takes more than one generation to achieve it yeah that's that's a really interesting thing because that that identity piece I think that's what like millennials and Gen Z probably struggle with the most when I talk to younger people that come through either the application that come through my internship program or whatever. So I'm talking to a, quite a few kids, not as many as you do, Jay, but enough that I get kind of a sense of where their head's at. And yeah, that, identi that identity piece is so difficult because they're already in their early 20s struggling with what they're going to do for the rest of their life. And they're not looking at things as series of problems to be solved. Everything has to feed into their identity. And I just, passion is something that is developed over time. It doesn't always come to you immediately you don't know necessarily in college what kind of impact you want to make and what you want to be known for but you, you i think kids are trying to find that and they're they're looking for that thing that that ties in with their identity i'm curious when you look at the younger people that you work with how do you think the last couple you know maybe the last year or so um is going to affect their mindset and and do you see positive th i mean I'm, I'm sure you see some silver linings but net effect do you think it's going to be overall negative or positive in the next generation so the hardest part, and this is why I love working with, with other generations to see their world through their eyes. When you go to a baseball game, no offense to people who love the sport, it is one of the slowest, boringest experiences that you can imagine. But when you watch baseball on the evening news and they just show you the highlight reel, oh my God, they hit it, they catch it, they run, they slide, they hit, they both, amazing sport. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what young people grow up today with social media. They see the greatest hits reel of everybody else's lives. And so they feel lacking, okay? What, what mm -hmm. fashion magazines or beauty magazines used to do to women's self-esteem, social media does to an entire generation. No one can live up to a manufactured greatest hits life, okay? So that's what they're up against. But what they also can see is that nothing has to define them. And so when you, when you realize whoever you were yesterday, whoever you told yourself, whatever preconditions you put on yourself, that was yesterday. Today you can wake up and be whoever and do whatever you want. And I've watched this again and again, and that's why I wrote Disrupt You. One, everybody thinks of changing the world, but nobody thinks of changing themselves. Once you can change that voice in your head of what I can't do, then you realize the whole world's malleable and you can you can literally change anything. Yeah. But then people haven't taught you how. We have this educational system that was designed to make factory workers so you can make someone else's dream come true. I mean, I love that I took trigonometry in high school because it's so handy in trigonometry season. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, think back to all the lost opportunities to teach people about being an entrepreneur, about how to do their taxes, about how the world works, about anything, you know? Peloponnesian Wars, eh, not so important. We're stuck in this, this, this mind warp. So what is coming out of it is people are saying, do I really want to graduate college with a mortgage and not a house? Or could I learn stuff online? Could I, could I take the, the energy to do it on my own? And so the knowledge is out there. 
And there are people that want to help. So it all starts, if I can just get on a, a, one of my many soapboxes. In fourth grade, Matt, you were taught that business was this. Jay buys a banana for $1, I sell it to you for $2. That's how I make money. Right. I can only make money by taking your money or Greg's money, Gene's money. And that's called, that's like a poker game. You can only win what's on the table. That's called right. zero sum game in game theory. There's, yeah. there's no other money in the world. That is BS, guys. Mm -hmm. Here's how you make money. Here's how there's a, pre-pandemic, there was a self-made billionaire every 48 hours. Now it's every 26 hours. So I don't know what you guys did the past couple of days, but you're a bunch of slackers. Um, <laughs> right? And the Warren Buffett method works. He just hit 100 billion, okay? But he made 99% of that after he was 50. And let me tell you, Kylie Jenner hitting a billion at 22 is going to have a lot more fun, okay? So here's how money's really created. It's created. It doesn't come from somebody else with the Federal Reserve. I'm starting a new company, Matt. I'll sell you 10% for 10,000. What do I now have? 10,000 in cash and 90,000 in equity that I can hire people with, buy stuff. Steve Jobs never learned to write code, couldn't make a computer if his life depended on it, but he gave equity in this make-believe piece of paper company called Apple to Wozniak and built the first trillion dollar company. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be an engineer. Everything's a high-tech company, by the way, is one of the 12 truths, even real yeah. estate. And if you yeah. don't embrace that, my favorite game, Play along with me. Um, if I gave you a million dollars, but you have to pick the most successful tech stock of the past decade, what would you pick? <laughs> of the past decade? Uh, yeah, you'd pick something like Amazon, Apple, one of the, one of the big four probably. Nope. Not Facebook. <laughs> Remember I, I said everything's a tech company. Mm -hmm. The number one tech company is Domino's Pizza. When they went <laughs> app-based, Yep. The majority of their employees work on IT now. They now have a direct relationship with their customers. They can test market stuff. They can get feedback. They can do everything automated. And their stock outperformed Apple and Google and Facebook and everybody else during the past decade. Yeah, that's an insane, insane anecdote. Uh, yeah, it's it's such a really great example because, yeah, I think we, uh, you know, like we're, we're in real estate. It's such an old stodgy industry full of people that are, essentially stuck in the same way the business was being done in the 70s. And the players that are coming in have that mentality you mentioned. Everything is a tech company. And, and they're going to crush you, them. And you don't think title is insurance is going to be automated? You don't think replacing the humans that input stuff into MLS and let the individuals do it and everything else? Mm -hmm. Anything that can be automated will be. And yeah. anytime that there is fat in a system, I mean... The idea that you sell a multi-million dollar house and are expected to have costs exceeding 6% of it is unjustifiable. Yeah. Whoever I'm offending in the audience, it's true. <laughs> so whether you believe it or not, it will be uh, squeezed. Mm -hmm. It will be made more efficient. Yep. 100% agree. Yeah, it's uh, it's going like that's a great way to put it. It's going to get squeezed. Uh, and I think that's what uh, real estate needs to be aware that that's coming and it's going to come by technology that focuses on the consumer's experience and giving like solving a real legitimate problem, but in a different way than they've you know solved right. it up to this point. And there's no reason that someone in real estate can't do that. The problem is they probably won't like the solutions are going to come from people with a fresh perspective be specifically because of that. They're looking at, at at it from a different point of view, usually the consumer's point of view. Like that's what I see most of the time going on in real estate. They come at it from the the goal of preserving the agent's role in the transaction, not from the point of view of the consumer of giving what the consumer really wants, which is like you said, to get the transaction done and and squeeze out as you know, squeeze as little of that lost net worth as humanly possible. A hundred percent. Like the greatest example of this as I can vividly remember, being in New York in, a, in the rare heavy snow in New York City, which also meant that you can't find a cab because everybody now needs a cab. So your feet are cold, you're wet, you're whatever. You finally wait forever. You find that cab and you want to give him directions and he doesn't speak the language that you speak and multiply that by every city in the world that I go to and then you don't have the right currency. Uber... You just stand there. It shows up. It knows where to go. Nothing goes in and out of my pocket. You cannot envision something better. 
And then the data that they're going towards, that's why Travis then figured out Uber Eats. They realized so many people were going around to different places that they invented ghost kitchens. Why should you have a driver go to McDonald's and this one and that when you can have one warehouse that makes all these franchisees? Now you don't need the franchisee, okay? <laughs> Wait, why pay all that to the McDonald's brand or this or that when you can now see what people are eating and you can create new virtual brands like faux this or you know for Vietnamese food or whatever and test these before you go and open a physical restaurant? You can have a built-in base. So it's all about data. The only competitive advantage anyone has in the 21st century is getting insights from their customers faster than the competition. Mm. And that's yeah, real estate, that's restaurant, that's anything that you do. And if you're not thinking of your life in terms of data in and data out, then you're going to get crushed. Yeah. Which brings it back to one of the two fundamentals, insight and perseverance. And the companies that are based around generating better insight faster, they'll win. And the ones that can't will, will be essentially left behind the dust. Yeah. My, 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 my favorite hero uh, of, of the month is a, is a girl who just won her high school uh, uh, science fair. I don't know about you guys, but I was literally the guy that made the baking soda and vinegar volcano. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I was proud of my volcano. Okay. Um, this young woman, 16, 17 years age, realizes that when people have surgery, the biggest problem is infection. So why don't we make stitches, sutures, that change color if there's an infection? And she figured out how to do this with just a beet because the, 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 the plant, the, the beet root, has a different pH balance in the skin and it'll change color anyway. We won't get into the science. <laughs> she was smart enough to figure out how to patent this, okay, while in high school. And we'll now say the fourth largest cause of death in the U.S. is hospitals, okay? <laughs> Not what you went in for, just hospitals. Hospital mistakes. Um, yeah, it's like 250,000 people a year. So think of the impact that this young woman did by just looking at a basic problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe she had a cut and it got infected. Maybe whatever it was. It's, it's that 30-day process. And we benefit by people solving problems for us. So selfishly, the more people I help, the better the world becomes and the mm -hmm. more enjoyment I get to have. That's I mean, right. since, since last we were together, I mean... Not to talk politics, but when I saw what happened in Congress in January, what I saw was thousands of people feeling left out, left behind, fighting over leftovers. The bottom 140 million Americans own less than 0%. They have a negative net worth. Yeah. So they were promised, get the good job, get the pension, live happily ever after. That doesn't exist. At the same time, Greg, during this pandemic, the 150 wealthiest Americans doubled their net worth. Not what they make in a year, they doubled their lifetime's worth. So what are those people doing differently? Can it be taught? Can it be shared? Can people benefit? And in Future Proofing You, I prove it because Vin did it on his own. Mm -hmm. And yes, he worked very hard. He right. had no social life. He watched, the average person spends five and a half hours on their phone a day and watches Tiger King and watches the sports <laughs> and every other wasted thing. So the excuse that you don't have the time, BS. You're not smart enough. High IQs don't end up wealthier. I, I show all the studies of that. You don't know anybody. This guy's literally an immigrant with no family here, all by himself, doesn't know a soul, okay? So I'm hoping everybody that hears my voice right now is at least better off than where he started so that they know it's achievable. And as you know, as I did with, with Disrupt You, I have a free workbook at jsamet.com so you can get the most out of each chapter. There's no upsell here, folks. Jay isn't selling anything. You can't pay for a mastermind. You can't pay for a, a, a mug with my mug on it. Um, I'm just <laughs> trying to pay it forward. Yeah. If, you're, if you really want the mug, Greg, I'll make one. That's okay. right. Okay, um, I, I, and, do. And, I do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, if, and especially since uh, Jay, you're like you're you're thinking about launching a Facebook group, and and you're kind of like flushing out the details on that. Uh, we talked a little bit about that before we hit record. Uh, so people should go to your website, jsamet.com. Get you've got two workbooks they can get for both disrupt yep. you and for future proofing you. That will get them on the email list, which means they will get updated on 
developments like yeah. Facebook groups and so, stuff like that. So you guys have been so good to me. I, I, I haven't talked about this on podcast, but so many people that read the, the book and I'm, I'm, I, I'm humbled by the response that people really, really embrace this book. They all thought to themselves, they should be my next mentee. Okay. And they each tell me their life story of why they're so special. I cannot mentor everybody on the planet one at a time, which is why I write a book for the price of a cronut and a macchiato. You can get all my life's knowledge. Okay. <laughs> I think it's a fair exchange. Okay. But <laughs> what I was talked into by one fan is we're going to set up a Facebook group. It's my name and like millionaire or some, some name like that. You can find it on Facebook where I'm going to try to mentor or more importantly, have the community, the village of people mentor a thousand people this year from July 1st till next year, July 1st, from whatever condition you're in to making your first million. And the reason I think this will work is because one, I'm insane, but two, what's <laughs> happened when I taught this at the university level is everybody starts off and believes their idea is really good. They're not. But in a group setting, Greg's going to look and say, Gene's idea is really, really better than mine, and Gene needs help. Gene, can I join your team and start doing it? Because you're, there's no one-person company, okay? So mm -hmm. from those 1,000 people, maybe it'll percolate a smaller number of successful companies that now have international distribution, have a crowd for crowdfunding, have all the attributes that me giving you know, talks to the group and, and, and mentoring in, in a, uh, you know, uh, college like auditorium type, you know, virtualized setting is really, I'm just the catalyst for that change, but getting people that are all stepping forward to, to want to see change and are open to changing their assumptions about how the world works. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can tell, and I can hear in your voice, and I and I and I, I actually did download um, the Disrupt You handbook, and I did go through it, and it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So anybody who is uh, is thinking about it, absolutely get these handbooks, go through them. Jay is absolutely no bullshit. He is going to drop hammer on you in the most positive way. And like he said, he doesn't want to sell you a damn thing. He just wants to bring value to you, pay it forward. He's been through trials and tribulations. He wants to save you from those. Um, and Jim, I just want to thank you for coming on. And I've told Matt a thousand times, he, he, he can't be a one man show, but Matt doesn't listen. He just always wants to persevere as a one man show, but Gene and I have been putting him through therapy. Our bills are through the roof, but it's okay. It's going to be worth it. In the end, I promise you. Um, but yeah, I, I, this is such a good thing. You know, Jay, the one thing that I've really taken away from you and I'm glad I can get back on the internet's back working is it's, it's the question of what problem do you want to solve? If you can meditate on that and really resonate with that and really get clear with it, take your dog for a walk, you know, take your goldfish for a walk, whatever you want to do, get out there and think about what's the problem you want to solve. I actually used to have a little black book, not like what you guys are thinking, but an actual little black book that I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'd write ideas down about problems that I saw and holes that I could fix in different businesses, ideas, companies, and everything else. And guess what, Jay? I never acted on any of them because I didn't have the guidance that you're providing in these two books. And I think that is something that it's going to, like you like you want to do, you're going to create multimillionaires around the world because you are going, you've already, you've already taken the machete, you took the machete and chopped down the jungle and then laid the paved road. Now all they have to do is walk on the freaking paved road and they'll be able to live the life of their dreams. And that, if you guys don't see the value in that, Please stop watching the podcast because it, that is painful if you don't see that. No. I mean, Greg, I can't tell you how many emails I get from people that told, told me, oh, I just saw this product come out that was on my list from last year, from two years ago. <laughs> if only. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm guilty of it as well because I'm not trying to launch new things from, from, from scratch. But I remember when I was remodeling a house, I'm like, why can't I control my thermostat from an app? There was no such thing on the market. I'm like, this is lame. And, you know, first world problem. If you have multiple homes, you know, it's an important thing. You're driving out to the desert. You want the AC on when you get there. I mean, um, I have such a hard life, uh, which is why I'm paying it forward. But you see these things all the time. Let me tell you a problem that an engineer who worked for me 20 years ago 
reached out to me. And this one, I had to say yes. And I became executive chairman working my butt off for this company. But someone 100 years ago thought the genius way to grow food was to put a bunch of poison that would kill all the insects, all the, all the weeds, small mammals, birds. But it wouldn't do anything to us, okay? <laughs> Cancer rates through the roof and everything. This is how we grow food. This is insane. And he came with a little idea of basically these bigger than a Roomba, but the size of an ice chest, little robots that go up and down row crops and take care of the weeds. Okay. Oh. Uh, a swarm of them. Think of goats going up to clear brush on a hill. They yeah. just go up and down corn, cotton, milo, soy. Uh, the company's called Greenfield Robotics. But let me tell you the problem that this solves. Okay. Because I had no farming background. He had the farming background. One the reason why farmers till the soil is to chop up weeds and to get ahead of them. By tilling it, you're releasing carbon. The number one source of greenhouse gases and warming of the planet is not factories and cars, it's agriculture. So mm. you solve that. Number two, look up at the Roundup lawsuits or anything else. I don't want to get sued by these giant companies. But <laughs> you take carcinogens out of the hands of, of, of our food that we eat. Number three, the farmer now is growing organic, which means they make 40% more per acre. Farmers in 2020 in the U.S., 100% of farmers lost money. Let that sink in. Mm -hmm. Food prices are skyrocketing as climate change devastates growing crops. So now farmers can, can survive. You don't have the poisons running down the Mississippi. There's no fish in the Gulf of Mexico from all that runoff. So all these things can be solved by these little ugly robots. I wish we could make the cute ones, but they're ugly. <laughs> so morally, how can I sleep at night knowing that that solution exists and not doing everything that I can in my power to get that company to succeed? Yeah, and this, I'm guessing this is the one that you're the chairman of right now. Yeah. So, yeah. so do I focus on thermostats so that multiple homes can be the perfect temperature when I arrive? <laughs> <laughs> or do I save life on this planet? I mean, you know, yeah. Jeff uh, Bezos and, and Elon are doing a great job making rockets. I can't take anything away from that. But before I work on plan B, I really like to focus on everything I can to save plan A, which is planet Earth, because mm. all my friends are here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, it'd be nice to not have to leave. Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, so, you know Jay, uh, I... I I know Matt's got a bounce here in a minute. He, he, we got to get him set up for another show. But, you know, when it comes to just thinking about small things and things you want to solve, um, I, this is going to go counterintuitive to what you just said. But my grandfather back in the 50s, um, he, he, all of us who enjoy those little uh, pre-planned packages of salads that you can buy in all your Safeway markets and everywhere else, he's actually, he and his team, he was the leader of the team that actually invented those little bad salads because they're trying to solve a problem so they could sell they could do, do less production to save more of the soil to put less carbon out. And that's one of the big things that they were going out there to do. So it's a, it's a small, yeah. small things. When you're starting out, don't try to solve global warming and those things. That, my whole point is it's the, the simplest little inconvenience could be the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like talking know, to Matt on a daily basis. So I can, I can just we can work on text messaging or an app there. You know, So we can just do that. Would that be a good yeah. start? <laughs> Look, Greg, Greg, I would love for you to get involved with the group. I would love oh, for you to em em embrace this. And, you know, it's the old thousand points of light. If we can just start teaching people, there was there was one of the, the most impactful things that came out of Disrupt You was a teacher who taught in a, in a tough neighborhood where the kids had a choice of, would you like fries with that or going to prison? Those were their two options after high school. <laughs> um, asked for the rights to turn disrupt you into high school course, and I gave her the rights and everything. She earned teacher of the year, and then wow. I kind of le leaned on HP. I said, "You guys uh, are into printing, right? Why don't you print copies of this uh, student workbook for every boys and girls club, right? Wow. You know, so we all can can make a difference with the time that we have." Dude, that's some heavy stuff, brother. I mean, I love having you on here because we don't get you on for long enough. Oh, Matt's gone. Bye, Matt. Um, but he's got another show going. But I mean, what what you talk about, Jay, is so powerful and so incredible. Um, I, I want everybody to know exactly where they can go. They go to jsamet.com and they can get all of your stuff. Is that correct? 
That's correct. And, and you can link to me on LinkedIn or follow me on social media. I'm very accessible as much as I and, wish I wasn't. And as you guys can tell, he's, he's incredibly intelligent and just one heck of a good dude. Great heart, you know, brilliant mind. He's been behind a ton of things that we're not going to talk about. For all the dyslexics out there, guys, it's J-A-Y-S-A-M-I-T dot com. Uh, I do that because I'm dyslexic, and I love to have things spelled out for me because uh, sometimes I don't get it right. And as you know, I'm dyslexic, and I talked about that, and one out of three Fortune 500 CEOs is dyslexic. It's a superpower. That, make, that makes us geniuses, Jay. That's why we're brothers from another mother. <laughs> no, well, well, in all seriousness, if you lean into what makes you unique, that's half of it. And I, one of the 12 truths is finding your superpower. I write about a, a kid in middle school, ADHD. And they, they dope the kid up and, and he's in a fog and he begs his mom and his doctor. The only time he can feel clear is swimming in the backyard. So he said, if I agree to swim every day in the pool, will you take me off these meds? And they agreed. And so he kept his promise and he did it every day. And by the end of his teenage years, he had 17 Olympic medals. And you know him as Michael Phelps. <laughs> his superpower is the ADHD. Dude, I'm dyslexic and ADHD, and I'll tell you one thing. I was put on meds for the majority of my life. I stopped the meds because when, when I got onto them last time, uh, this is probably seven plus years ago, I got so high, like I was floating on clouds, and I'm like, this is, can't be right. Like, this is not normal. And uh, okay. I loved it because, I mean, I was a you know young young 20-year-old, but I made that same decision. I made a decision to go running and do workouts every single day and, and, and shift and, my and, life. And I'm not giving medical advice, and I'm not qualified to do that, but here's, here's what I'm trying to say. When we needed factory workers, we created an educational system to create conformity, mm. okay? Why do schools have uniforms? Why do military have uniforms? Take away individuality, expression yeah. to, to fit that box. There are no get a 40-year job and get a pension and live happily ever after. That era is gone. And we have so many problems that need addressing. Why aren't we as a society creating people that solve problems and get rewarded for that, hmm. right? Because we all benefit. I mean, how thrilled are we that, that somebody went to med school and spent the time to figure out how to make a vaccine? I mean, mm -hmm. nobody has polio thanks to Jonas Salk. I mean, we take these things for granted, right? Yeah. So, so there's endless new problems and you don't have to start with the biggest. You can start with such a small minor tweak and the solution may be used somewhere else and you can bring it here and just look at your own life and start with those around you. Yeah. That, it's such an insightful takeaway for this show. Guys, again, I want you to go to Jay Samet, uh, S A M I T.com. I want you to download everything he has. Um, obviously, get his new book, uh, Future Proofing You. It's a phenomenal book. I can't wait. I'm going to download it literally right after the show when I can get on my laptop here uh, and really kind of dive deep on this. Figure out what problem you can solve, guys. Find your passion. Get passionate. We are all so dispassionate right now. I mean, Gene hasn't said a word the whole show, so he's very dispassionate about this. Um, but I mean, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's the opposite of that, dude. Class was in session today, and your boy was taking notes. Trust me when I tell you. Oh, dude, me too. Yeah, you kidding? No, it was good stuff. It was, I I popped in when I needed to, but there's no need for me to override the Gr the great Jay. So I trust Gr me. Great, Greg, Greg, the chapter that because I know you well enough that you will, your mind will explode. So read it outdoors <laughs> or listen to it outdoors is the one on deal structure. When I go through oh. all these all these billionaires that they made their money not from the way that you think. And, really? and, and when you start realizing how e easy it is to turn your side hustle into a giant revenue stream, um, uh, you, you know my artwork, the, the, the wealthiest living painter in the world only basically sold one painting of any note, and he made over a billion dollars for it, a billion with a B. Really? Zuckerberg, when he had the Facebook offices, wanted them to look cool and didn't have any money. He got a graffiti artist in there who wanted to charge him $30,000 to paint it. And the instead, Asian guy. he gave him stock. Yeah. That stock turned into a billion dollars. There's <laughs> always a way to structure a deal to have an upside. Yeah, that's, I've that's done it a million times. That's the Asian gentleman, correct? I, I, uh, I have to flip up the book to remember his name. Yeah. 
Um, I've, I've, I've read that. I've looked at that story several times, and I've always been fascinated by how that how that was done because they were doing horse trading, as you call it, deal deal structure, and you know they're giving one for the other when one needed one thing, one needed was taking a chance on the other, and it's, it's a fascinating concept. And you can we're going to close on this, but you can do deal structure with every aspect of your life. It could be with your kids, your spouse. It could be with business partners. You can deal structure on every aspect of life. Is that correct? Yes, but I, I tend to focus just on, uh, you know, if you're, if you're negotiating with your children, you've already lost. So let's focus <laughs> on, on what you can achieve. And that is you can look at every time you're looking to monetize some aspect of your life and a different way to structure it so that you have lasting revenue, you have a potential for an upside when people are happy to give it to you. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about that in how you go about purposefully is the difference between existing and thriving. Oh man, what phenomenal. Takeaways, guys. Again, go to jsamet.com. Take away every, you know, take everything that he has to offer. He's not trying to sell you, so this is not a pitch. Like he said, like think, think of three, three or four times. Gene, I need you to do your job. I know Jay's got a busy schedule. I do not want to take any more of his time, even though I could sit here and listen to his voice all day long and sit at his feet and learn like a monk, uh, you know, learning from his master. Uh, Gene, what's the favorite uh, color for the bow on the show today? Let's go ocean blue. I love Ocean Blue. All right, guys. There's Ocean Blue. Jay Samet. Thank you, guys. I want you guys to go everywhere you listen to podcasts, watch podcasts. I want you to give us a five-star, not a two-star review. That helps the algorithm sync up. And if you guys like what Jay said, please tag him in any comment. Please purchase his book. Please download his manuals and worksheets and everything else he has. Jay, you're the man, the myth, the legend of all things that we can never talk about because we don't have that long of a show. Um, but we love to have you back on. Uh, go deep again if you if you have the time to do it. But we appreciate you more than you know. Until next time, guys. Peace out, ninjas. We gone.